episode 7 is taken from Luke chapter 2, Bethlehem. It was really the last thing they needed, more than a three-day journey from the north down to the south, even further than a trip to Jerusalem. Mary had been feeling the weight of this child, the heaviness of imminent birth, for close to a month now. It was difficult to sleep, so uncomfortable these days. Yet each morning brought the hope that it would all be over soon. She had tried to stay within the confines of Joseph's little house as much as she could. The neighbourhood and its thoughts on her pregnancy were distressing features which lurked awkwardly at the edge of her world. Nevertheless, she had no idea how. She had managed to maintain a determined and steady attitude. The last days were approaching and each little kick, each sharp twinge and occasional tightening of extended muscle reminded her that nothing under heaven lasts forever. Everything has its time and its season. They had, like everyone else in the town, received notification of the census and it could only be truly and honestly taken in the location of family heritage and birth. Both Mary and Joseph had legitimate calls to travel south to Bethlehem. The timing couldn't be helped. There would be others in the same position, others worse off than themselves. At least she wasn't sick, she was only pregnant. The news was that officials had been charged by the Emperor to travel throughout the whole Roman Empire to make as definitive account as possible of the people living under their rule. Whether this was for taxation purposes or for other reasons, perhaps a device employed by Augustus to pin down his place in history, nobody on the ground, in Nazareth at least, knew for certain. This was the last thing they needed. As they approached the town and joined the multitude heading along the road, a bloated footfall funnelling towards the gates, the weary couple realised that they were amongst some of the last people to arrive in Bethlehem. It became clear that the small town was hot and heady and fit to burst. Bethlehem, the house of bread, the place where David had been anointed king, lay about six miles from Jerusalem and could only be reached by a road through the hills. It was an ancient town, mostly overshadowed by its more magnificent neighbour, yet despite its minor position, it held on to a notion of a superior heritage especially over those who travelled down from the far north. The prophecy, long held, hidden under centuries of dust, was very soon to be scoured by the wind of heaven, the cobwebs dismissed and glory revealed. But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are of old from ancient times. The throng gathered at the gates in the evening light. The very nature of that throng, selfish and unyielding, meant that the crowds shoved and bayed to get inside. Each family group, honourable only in a desire to shelter its own, acted shamefacedly against all others in their efforts to secure a bed for the night. The road that Mary and Joseph had taken had not been easy, and their means of transport one donkey between the two of them, had not been anything other than slow and painstaking. It was all they could afford if they were to stay in Bethlehem for any length of time. Who knew how long this census would take? In their experience, nothing like this had ever been attempted before, and if it hadn't been for the government decree against which there could be no gain saying, the spent couple would not have attempted the journey. Please, let us through. Joseph had roared, his voice strident above the crowd. Mary had never heard him speak this way before. She was at once astonished and fearful at his sudden vociferousness. To her and to others, his manner had always been mild, the one to smooth over an argument rather than start one. He was the one who had whispered calm words in her ear when the birth pains had started just hours before. When he began to force his way through the surly crowd, it would have been embarrassing if she had not felt such desperation. 
if she had not actually been standing in labour beside a donkey at the gates of Bethlehem. Shortly before they reached the gates, the overwhelming need to get off the donkey and walk had gripped her. She did not want to stand, but she certainly did not want to sit on the animal any longer. Every jolt and ripple up through its tired legs had caused her cramps to worsen and the bones in her back to slip. It was for her sake and the sake of the child that Joseph was employing such rough tactics, and for that she was grateful. But her natural inclination to remain in the background, an inclination that had only been compounded during recent months in the face of social disapproval, left her struggling between character and circumstance. This was the last thing Bethlehem needed. The only things to greet the weary-eyed Galilean couple were the usual expected smells and sounds of, of a provincial Judean town. Apart from the shouldering of humanity focused purely on their desire to get inside, sweat-soaked beasts of burden, dank and dusty from the road, converged with rough and rickety wooden carts which unwittingly snagged their splinters on people's garments as they jolted roughshod through the gates of Bethlehem. Joseph had managed to carve a route for their fragile party through the solid crowd. Mary's whimpers of pain, slowly becoming stifled cries, were the motivation that powered him forward. He tried not to let frightening thoughts of what they would do, what would happen next when they finally reached shelter and the baby would arrive. Reaching shelter. Now that they were finally through the gates, this was his new goal, and in the face of such competition, despair overwhelmed him. The storm of urgency and frustration that had rumbled at the gates only seemed to be magnified once inside the town. The rough jumble of buildings jostled with the raucous rabble. Everyone desperate to secure lodging for the night. Joseph could only think that he and his wife had priority. It was natural that he should prefer and protect those dearest to him. And it was his duty, a duty that sprang from love. As well as the woman he honoured, there was a child, and there had been angels. There had been dreams, and there had been prophecies. This was the last thing everybody needed. Over and above their own needs were those of a woman about to give birth. In the hearts and minds of the many travellers filling the town, a moral battle was being fought. The needs of this woman were obvious, but were they above their own? Accommodation was tight and at a premium. Family homes were already welcoming their own distant relations. Yet when faced with this woman's urgent requirements, the visitors could only justify their own. There were some women with their families who for a moment found their hearts softening at the sight and sound of Mary in labour. Nevertheless, the whining cries of their children and the urgent demands of their husbands ensured that they turned away careful not to miss the last opportunity for shelter. They placated their troubled minds by telling themselves that somebody was bound to take pity on the woman and she would surely find somewhere to stay. They tried not to remember what it was like to give birth. Joseph and Mary found themselves at the centre of a whirlpool as people diverged off down alleyways, into doorways and under arches. Gradually each family group found a roof over their heads, either with relatives or in paid lodgings. However, the dwindling crowd gave them more room to move and for Joseph at least a moment to survey their surroundings. Mary was unable to scout around, all thoughts now focused on what was happening to her body. Joseph took a deep breath. He glanced at Mary, her face glistening with sweat, her eyes bright with fear and gathered his strength. He whispered a prayer. O oh Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. Perhaps he had been praying all the while. He couldn't be sure, and he wondered in that moment whether the angel was watching them. With slow yet deliberate steps, he headed with his labouring wife and placid donkey towards the least crowded street he could see. They did not have time to seek out the home of as yet unknown relations. If he could only secure a lodging somewhere, anywhere, then as far as it lay in his power he would have done all he could. 
there was a small gathering of people in the shadows outside a candlelit doorway. Sounds of plates being scraped, satisfied souls and chattering families drew them forward, all the signs indicating that this was probably an inn. Surely there would be a corner for this couple, who was so much in need. Just a corner would do. He didn't know the name of the street and he didn't have the strength to make inquiries. Joseph shook himself. What was he thinking? Mary could not give birth in any old corner in front of prying eyes. Never had he felt so unprepared, as if he had set out on a voyage without planning for the most obvious eventuality. On approaching the doorway, the few people gathered there stepped aside, as if Joseph and Mary were contaminated. Mary bit her lip as another dragging wave of pain engulfed her. Her teeth clenched as she tried to restrain the moans and distress that longed to escape from her throat. As the pain rolled away for a moment, she managed to tell Joseph that she couldn't walk any further. From the doorway, a little girl, wide-eyed, her mouth a silent gasp, turned tail. She darted back inside the inn. Surely, Joseph thought, a woman in labour was not that unusual a sight. But the little girl had merely reacted on instinct where everyone else had failed. Within seconds she reappeared again, her hand clasping another. Like her daughter, her mother too acted on instinct. Any inner battle this woman might have had was over before it had had a chance to begin. They were full to bursting in the inn, she told Joseph. However, she was not going to let a woman give birth in the street, not while she had any say in the matter. Never had a man been so grateful for the practical ministrations of a woman. At the back, behind the family home, carved into the hillside rock, was the owner's animal shelter, which of course would suit the donkey, but it would also have to suit Mary and Joseph. It was a roof. It was shelter. It was relatively dry and nowhere near as crowded as the town had been earlier. The animals within were only concerned about food and water, they huddled into one corner of the stable, ignoring the intrusion of human activity. Before Joseph even had to ask, the woman sent the daughter to fetch the midwife. She disappeared and then reappeared with a stool for Mary to sit upon. She also brought with her a mound of clean cloths and a pitcher of water. This was all they needed, the owner of the lodging had retorted after his wife had explained the situation but she brushed his comment aside. A midwife had already been sent for. Very soon she arrived, her hands strong and ready for work. With hardly a word she put down her basket and took off her cloak, and coming close to Mary she assessed the situation. For a few minutes Joseph turned away and occupied himself with rubbing down the donkey's perspiring coat, all the while listening out for Mary's breathing. A pattern of short, steady bursts was broken every few minutes by strained screams. He had never been in a situation like this before. Despite his better judgment, he had imagined it, but his preconceptions now paled in reality. It was not his place to be there. It was not his place at all, but he had nowhere else to go. In his uselessness, he could only be present, and therefore he hoped useful. Mary was young and strong, but from what he could hear, the process seemed to be ripping her body apart. He turned briefly to look. She was not quite standing, yet not quite crouching as she gripped the strong braced arms of the midwife. He began to take steps towards her, but the midwife, with a glance and the flick of a finger, indicated that he should stay away. He continued to pray. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It was all he could manage. He wondered again if the angel was still watching over them. His eyes shut, Joseph remembered the dream, and in that dream he had not been afraid. Now he understood what fear really was. The angel had told him that Mary would give birth to a son, and that he, Joseph, was to give him the name Jesus, because he would save his people from their sins. So this was what was happening right now, but none of it seemed very holy. However, Joseph thought, 
If the angel of God had spoken and promised, then God was with them. He was with them there, in amongst the animals, and the now wet and bloody straw underfoot. Out of the corner of his eye, Joseph was aware of flickering figures in the dark doorway of the stable. The little girl was one of them who hovered and hopped from one leg to the other, a finger pulling at her lip, watching the novel evening spectacle. Her mother slipped back and forth, in and out of the shadows, between the demands of customers in the inn and the concerns of the woman giving birth. Joseph stood with both hands on the donkey's back, his head bent low. The donkey had his muzzle stuffed in a sack of grain. Neither Joseph nor Mary had eaten a proper meal in several days, but he couldn't bring himself to think about that now. He was willing this baby to be born. The midwife's voice, which had been calm and subdued up to this point, now grew louder and more insistent. Joseph spun around, thinking that something must be wrong. But nothing was wrong. She was just encouraging Mary through her last moments of pain. Then another voice wailed. A clear cry rose above the sounds in the stable. Joseph felt a shudder rumble down the donkey's back. The animal lifted his head for a moment and shook his tall, cone-shaped ears before dipping his nose back down to feed once again. Joseph stared with wonder while the midwife calmly wiped down the new baby's skin with a damp cloth. Then she wrapped him tightly in dry ones. The noise, the baby's cry, was not strident, but rather a melody, high and low, sharp and soft. New lungs stretching, expanding, pristine vocal cords quivering with the back and forth flurry of breath. Mary was still, although not silent, as she continued panting, now only through exhaustion. The sudden relief of giving birth spread like a shelter over all their minor troubles. At once Joseph knew what to do. From the pitcher he poured her a cup of water, then crouching down next to her they shared the drink. The midwife washed and wiped her hands, and Joseph wondered that something so incredible could be handled so expertly and without fuss. He had no idea what hour of the night it was, but a thousand stars were now visible. He could see them through the open doorway of the stable. He could also hear the general hubbub from the inn. It was still not that late in the evening. All at once the whole world had changed, and it had little to do with their journey to Bethlehem. It had little to do with Mary's pain, and it had little to do with an overcrowded town or a Roman census. It had everything to do with a prophecy fulfilled. Their current surroundings were so meagre, so human and so mundane, but Mary and Joseph had dreamed dreams. They had spoken with angels. This was all they needed. If the animals could have gathered their thoughts and understood the cause of their annoyance and irritation, they would have been quite disgruntled. They had been pushed aside in their own stable. One more donkey mouth to feed, and now only one manger to feed from. The smell from the other manger was not that of hay or straw. It was human, the sweet-smelling skin of a newborn baby. After making sure that Mary was settled... She was now nursing the baby at her breast. And after Joseph had managed to find a few coins amongst their luggage with which to pay her, the midwife left them. When she stepped out of the stable through the doorway, a last glance back confirmed her thoughts that the young girl was strong. She nodded an affirmation that all would be well. Joseph could not comprehend the heights and depths of emotion that had battered them that day, their situation was fragile. Although they were aware that here in Bethlehem they had distant family connections, they knew nobody. They had been shoved and harried by an anxious crowd and had only found shelter when it was almost too late. And yet, since the baby's arrival, the burden of it all and the exhaustion of the journey had fallen away, like the cares of the night with a new dawn. He could hardly tear his eyes away from the perfect figure. The tiny hands, the curling fingers and the eyes that closed in contentment as he fed. 
After a while, the child, their son, was satisfied, and Mary wrapped him up tightly once again in the cloths and laid him in a manger. Joseph whispered in her ear, We shall call him Jesus. Jesus. 